Welcome to Japan. We just got back from a 12 day tour of Japan, starting in Tokyo, which is an absolutely crazy city. We were definitely not prepared for what to expect. Being in Japan for cherry blossom season was on another level. And for some reason, at this particular point in time, everyone in the world seemed to be visiting Japan. So, with this video, I want to show you how to have the absolute best time you can while you're in Tokyo and all the cool stuff to see and do, along with essential traveling tips that you will need to survive. Let's get into it. When you first get to Japan, you will need to get a transit card. We got a Suka card and found it worked perfectly, but you can also get a Pasmo card as I think the Suka cards are not available at the moment due to a chip shortage. If you have an iPhone, you can still get a digital Suka card through the Apple wallet, which is what I had. Instructions can be found online for this. Otherwise, Pasmo cards can be purchased at train stations once you get to Japan. Navigating the train system can be a bit confusing at the start. It took us a whole day to figure it out. We used Google Maps, which is pretty dang accurate, even down to which carriage to get on, which helps massively for when you are changing lines, as sometimes you have to walk a long way in between stations. But once you get used to the train system, it's awesome. Be prepared to be very squashed if you are traveling at peak hour, as many people will literally cram into the train. You'll feel like a sardine in a can. The hotel rooms can be very small, especially the budget hotels. We stayed at APA Hotel. Hotel Shinjuku Gaiome Tokyo, which was an awesome location right on the road that you walk down to get to all the neon lights in Shinjuku. Make sure you book a hotel close to a train station to save you from walking too far, as you will be doing a lot of walking in Japan. We were averaging 20,000 steps a day. Now let's get into the fun stuff. Yay! Being in Japan for cherry blossom season, there was one spot I really wanted to see and photograph, so we headed over to Maguro River. These are the photos I had seen online, and this is what it looked like. No cherry blossoms. Oh no, God! Let's just add some anyway to make me feel better. Timing the cherry blossoms is really hard and they were predicted to be in bloom right now, but this year they were a week late. Thankfully, there was a four level Starbucks right there on the corner. So we ventured over only to find out that you have to sign in and wait until you are emailed to say that you are allowed to enter. We waited an hour and 20 minutes. Then you have to line up for ages to order because it's so busy inside. It was pretty impressive though. The pink Sakura cake I got and Kevin's rose and lychee drink were amazing. And being Sakura season meant there were lots of Sakura flavored drinks and treats. The big Tokyo wall covered in tea boxes, the rose gold coffee roasting machine, the wall covered in teacups. It was all very impressive and I'm glad I waited to see it. But if you don't want to wait, then sign up before you get there. So after my mini meltdown, thinking I wasn't going to see any Sakura trees on this whole trip to Japan, we did some research online while we were at Starbucks and found a group on Facebook called Tokyo Travel Tips, where people were posting live updates of where the Sakuras were in bloom. Apparently there were a few trees in Shinjuku Gaioan National Gardens, so we legged it over there. And on the way, we found a beautiful pink tree. So of course I had to stop and take photos in case it was going to be the only one I saw. The National Garden was a beautiful park and there were quite a few secure trees in bloom. There were also a lot of people trying to photograph them and get selfies, which we were soon to find out was going to be the case everywhere we went. After having enough of fighting the crowds, I saw some beautiful reflections on the lake and it was getting close to sunset, so I went down by the water to grab a few shots. For dinner that night, we headed to Ichiran, which is a pretty famous ramen restaurant that wasn't far from our hotel. And on the way, we saw the famous 3D cat billboard and also a cute submarine animation that appeared to come out of the screen. It was really cool. Of course, when we got to Ichiran, there was a lineup. We had to wait about 50 minutes before getting a seat. Once inside, you sit at a cubicle and are served your bowl of ramen without seeing the waiter's face and you order what you want at the vending machine before you sit at the cubicle. The ramen was okay, I wouldn't say it was the best. I did have a better one in Osaka. Then we went and explored the bright lights of Shinjuku. 
Shinjuku and Shibuya are the busiest and most popular areas of Japan and the most fun in my opinion. Either Shinjuku or Shibuya are great places to base yourself while you're staying in Tokyo. This guy was the best part of the whole trip. Okay, so next to Maddie. Please give me crowd. Please give me crowd. Please give me crowd. Thank you so much. Oh. One more again, please. Oh. Cool. Okay, my last. You. Oh. The next day, we woke up to rain and overcast skies, so we headed to Tsukiji Outer Market. I'm pretty sure I'm not pronouncing that right, which is an open seafood market. The outer market consists of narrow lanes filled with small shops, stalls and restaurants selling a wide variety of seafood, fruits, vegetables, kitchen tools and Japanese snacks. Visitors can explore the market's maze-like streets, sampling fresh sushi, sashimi, grilled seafood and other delicacies along the way. Again, this place was so busy and it's definitely a tourist attraction. At Tsukiji Market, we had a $25 beef skewer that was world famous Wagyu beef. It was pretty damn good. Even though I'm not a meat lover, it was pretty delicious and something you have to try when you're in Japan. We also tried the square egg on a stick which is very famous thanks to TikTok and Instagram. There was quite a line for this stall but it moved quite quickly and it kind of tasted sweet. I'm not a huge egg fan but Kevin is and he loved it. Is it good? Yeah. Do you love egg? Yeah. And I also wanted to try the famous fish that is like a pastry filled with red bean paste. I just noticed on the sign it's called Hon Maguro and it's a tuna shaped pie with a sweet bean. I had to wait about 20 minutes for this thing. It was so popular and it was really yum. It was very sweet and warm and went down really well because it was quite a cold day. Hot. These markets are open from 5 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day and definitely worth visiting if you're in Tokyo. That night we headed to the Azakusa Cultural Tourist Information Center to the level 8 viewing deck to see Nakamai's shopping street with Sensoji Temple at the end and also the Tokyo Sky Tree. As one of Tokyo's most iconic landmarks, the Sky Tree offers a breathtaking nighttime experience illuminated with vibrant LED lights that change colors periodically. Entry to the Azakusa Cultural Tourist Center is free. It was quite busy but really cool views. Then we headed down to walk through Nakamai's shopping street. Nakamai's is the most famous shopping street in Azakusa. The street runs for 250 meters on the main approach to Sensoji Temple and is lined on both sides with shops selling traditional souvenirs, snacks and sweets. Walking down Nakamaizi Street is like taking a journey through Japanese culture and history. All the stalls were closed as it was night time, but this gives you the opportunity to see the cool murals painted on the doors. The lanterns lighting the street illuminate the path with a warm inviting glow, creating a romantic and nostalgic atmosphere. We did manage to find one stall that was open and the guy was selling heart-shaped sponge cakes called Baby Castella. Their deliciously light and fluffy texture made them a delightful treat. Sensoji Temple, also known as Azakusa Canon Temple, is Tokyo's oldest and most significant Buddhist temple founded in 645 AD. It enshrines a statue of Canon 
the Goddess of Mercy, discovered by two fishermen in the Samita River. The temple complex features iconic structures such as the Thunder Gate with its giant red lantern and the five-story pagoda. It's a must visit if you're in Tokyo. I took some night shots here, although it was hard because it was still very busy even though it was 7.30 at night and drizzling rain. As a cruiser is a cool part of Tokyo, I really liked it and would love to stay here next time. Then for dinner we found a Japanese barbecue restaurant called Jugamu on Hoppy Street which was fun and so nice to sit down in a warm and cozy environment for a while. This restaurant offers a unique dining experience where you grill high quality meat and vegetables at your table. You can choose from various cuts and marbling grades of meat allowing you to customize your dining experience based on personal preferences. Each table is equipped with a grill where diners can cook their selections to perfection savoring the rich flavors and tender textures of the grilled meats. Now we need to talk about 7-Eleven because it will be your best friend in Japan. Along with Lawson's they have the best sandwiches and pre-packaged meals so if your accommodation has a kitchen this can save you loads of dollars. You can even get your food heated up at the 7-Eleven. The toilets in Japan are amazing too. All I'm going to say is heated seats and a bum washer. The next day we wanted to check out Takashita Street which is a vibrant and bustling pedestrian shopping street known for its eclectic mix of fashion boutiques, trendy shops, and unique eateries. Popular among teenagers and young adults, this iconic street offers a kaleidoscope of quirky and colourful styles, from gothic and lolita fashion to punk and kawaii, aka cute culture. It's also famous for its crepe stands, which we had to try, of course. Takashita Street is the birthplace of the famous teen Japanese fashion. This place was crazy busy. There were so many people walking down the street. I stopped on the side of the street to try and capture some of the eclectic fashion. I just love how expressive they are in the way they dress. Then we went to Tokyo Plaza Harajuku which has all the reflective mirrors in the shopping mall. When the traffic lights change on the street everyone is reflected in the mirrors and it looks like something futuristic. This is a famous Instagram spot but I hate doing selfies so I just did a time lapse and took a non selfie photo. After that we walked up the hill to Meiji Shrine. Meiji Shrine is one of Japan's most important Shinto shrines, dedicated to Emperor Meiji and his Empress Shokan. It was completed in 1920 to honor their contributions to Japan's modernization. Surrounded by a lush forest that covers 170 acres, the shrine provides a peaceful oasis in the heart of Tokyo. We then headed back to Shibuya Crossing to watch the sunset. We also found the famous Hachiko dog statue outside of Shibuya Station from the beautiful and very sad movie Hachi. If you haven't seen it, definitely go watch it. After that we found the Magnet Building and went up to the observatory deck for awesome views over Shibuya Scramble Crossing. It was so busy and they were turning people away but we hung around and managed to get in somehow for free. Usually you just have to buy a drink upon entry. We watched the sunset from there turn into blue hour which was so pretty and it was nice just to sit down and relax for a little bit. Back down on ground level we saw a Patrick car from Spongebob Squarepants and the Mario Karts were zooming past. We had booked that activity in on the last day so I was super excited to see those. Then it was time to check out Omoidi Yokocho, also known as Memory Lane or Piss Alley, which is an historic alleyway in Shinjuku, known for its narrow streets lined with small traditional bars and eateries. 
Emerging post World War II as a black market district, it has evolved into a popular spot for yakitori, awful dishes and drinks like sake and shochu. Adorned with red lanterns, the alley offers an intimate, nostalgic atmosphere that contrasts with Shinjuku's modern skyscrapers. Conveniently located near Shinjuku Station, it provides a unique glimpse into Tokyo's past, making it a beloved destination for both locals and tourists seeking an authentic culinary and cultural experience. I really felt like katsu curry for dinner so we did some googling and Coco Curry House was recommended. We went to the one in Shinjuku as there are a few Coco Curry houses around. It was delicious and we didn't have to wait and it was fast and fresh and just what I felt like. Next day we were on the hunt for cherry blossoms. We headed to Ueno Park as everyone had told us this was the place to see them. We were hoping so badly that the park would be filled with them, but sadly no. Still it was a gorgeous park with a huge lake in the middle and cute little swan and duck boats that you could hire. We did manage to find a couple of secure trees in bloom, but so did everyone else. It was still, it was a gorgeous day for being outside and enjoying the sunshine. <laughs> Next it was time to check out Chidoraga Fuchi Park. The one place I really wanted to get a good cherry blossom photo. Well, I say that about every spot, but this is where the famous pics of the boats on the lake with all the gorgeous cherry blossom trees hanging over each side of the river are taken. Like this photo, but they weren't blooming here either and they wouldn't be in bloom for another week. It really is hard getting the timing right for these cherry blossoms. So cutting our losses there, we went to Shiba Park to photograph Tokyo Tower. On the way there, we came across Zojoji Temple, which had a beautiful cherry tree flowering on the grounds with the Tokyo Tower in the background. Zojoji Temple is an impressive Buddhist temple complex housing the tombs of six Tokugawa shoguns. It is the only temple structure to have survived the bombings of World War II. So Joji was founded in 1393, but then relocated to the present site in 1598. Shiba Park is one of Japan's oldest public parks, established in 1873. The park is known for its expansive green spaces and its iconic view of Tokyo Tower, and looks suspiciously like the Eiffel Tower. The park is a popular spot for picnics, leisurely strolls, and seasonal cherry blossom viewing, providing a tranquil oasis amidst the bustling urban environment of Tokyo. After relaxing in the park for a while, I wanted to get a blue hour photo of Tokyo Sky Tree reflecting in water. I did some googling earlier that day and found a bridge that would work perfectly for the shot. So we jumped on the train and headed to Jukunbashi train station to find Jukun Bridge. The train ride was longer than usual and the area was so quiet compared to everywhere else we had been in Tokyo. It was actually so nice to not see anyone else for a while until we got to the bridge. I couldn't believe it. Every other photographer slash Instagrammer slash TikToker had the same idea. Most of the time when I am photographing sunsets or sunrises, I'm mostly by myself or only one of two other people around. But you honestly can't get a moment of peace in Japan. Still, it was an awesome location and everyone was being respectful of each other and quiet. And it's one of my favorite shots that I got from Tokyo. We then walked down to Solomachi building to look at the view from the 30th floor, which I heard was good, but the reflections on the glass were bad, so I didn't get any good shots. It was still quite impressive to see though. For dinner, we got takoyaki, which are octopus balls from one of the restaurants at the bottom of Solomachi building. 
and then crepes for dessert. The octopus balls were tasty. The octopus was a bit chewy and I'm not a fan of eating octopus after watching my octopus friend and seeing how intelligent they are. So that was it for day four. The next day was our last day in Tokyo and one of the moments that I had been waiting for the whole trip. For our last day in Tokyo, we were booked in to do the Mario Street Car through Shibuya. This was heaps of fun. Just a heads up that you need to book this well in advance. I think I booked it two months out from our trip and literally could only get the last slot on the last day that we were in Tokyo so book early. You can only film while stopped at the lights too. It's quite expensive at $130 Australian each but well worth it. We booked through Kluke as it was the easiest option and I'm not sponsored by Kluke. Drove through Shibuya Scramble Crossing which was really cool and all over Tokyo for about 45 minutes. It was super fun and I highly recommend it if you can afford it. Then we had to rush to catch the bus to our next location, which was Mount Fuji and Lake Kawaguchi. This will be my next video, so make sure you are subscribed to my channel so that you don't miss it. Thanks for watching!